when I saw the invitation for the presentation today, I was a bit amused to be referred to as the patriarch of the Liphausen family. Um, I don't think we're any different than anybody else. We've got two sons that were keen to come back on the farm. They both um, started with a bit of, uh, both got off farm income jobs. Christopher contract harvest. has got a number of headers and Sebastian does pregnancy scanning, but uh, both of them, it was a means to an end. They both wanted to come back on the farm and, and it needed to be paid for because my original farm wasn't big enough to hold us all. And uh, over a period of time, We've just been lucky that farms have come up within a reasonable distance that we could afford at the time and yeah, timing's everything that, that, um, that's worked and, and this is where we're at at the moment. Just as far as our water job goes, I'm just going back a few years, I first started, like John said, in 1980 and I was there, experienced all the good water years, which when you talk to the younger generation now, seems a bit like a fairy tale, you know, off allocation as much as you could take until Christmas or later, 140% um, allocation nearly uh, often enough and, and never more than 70%. So when you talk about that now, there's the amount of water that was around, it's, it's hard to imagine. But you know, since the 90s, we've had so many things have changed on us. We've had the cap on water. We've had uh, separating the water from the land government taking buybacks, uh, changing water trading rules between valleys and another big one that's looming now is the almond industry that's developing downstream that's got the capacity to take all our water and, and the other challenge is just that the river capacity can't even get it down there. So they're the challenges we've got now. So the whole water business has changed. So our approach now is we have dabbled, uh, just the last stop point, we have tried over the years to secure water in other valleys and uh, have carryover. We had some in Victoria and, and uh, one of the things we did, we had a five year uh, carryover agreement down between the Murray and, and the Goulburn in Victoria. But now the Goulburn River's rules have all changed. And if I was down there, I'd be pushing for that too, just to keep their water in the valley and stop using too much. So, so what we're finding now is that all the there's no loopholes left anymore. They've just got to, if you're going to do something, you've just got to go out and buy water. So we've taken the approach that we're irrigation farmers. We've got to go and buy water. What's the number we buy it at? So Troy was putting up some numbers there on rice, but we've looked at, uh, at other crops. The original farm's the only one that had water entitlements on it. The rest of them, we ended up with delivery entitlements, uh, the other two farms. Um, so our little bit, on, that far, on the one farm that's got entitlements, we've only got a limited capacity for carryover. Um, some of the other products we've just taken on now is uh, purchasing, purchasing carryover capacity within Murray Irrigation, that was just through a trader. Um, so it's all about coming back to a number that we're comfortable with, that we can afford for water for next year. And if we can get water at that price, then we start locking it in. It, uh, it's, it's, um, it's not rocket science. But the other side of the operation is we're looking at what crops we can grow. They're going to maximise the um, return that we're going to get on those crops. So we're starting to look at different <coughs> irrigation systems. We've dabbled in the past. You know, you know everyone's lasered, good lasered border check, uh, lasered contours for rice. Um, we've dabbled in V-bays, Harry Calusa's sort of uh, brainchild, and sort of been happy with those. Uh, but we've still had problems where we've watered crops up and then it's rained and we've had terrible crops out of it and you can't be watering crops and paying good money for water and not getting a result. So more recently we've been dabbling with, uh, so on the second farm we bought the soil types suited beds and we've been dabbling with the beds and then looking at the crops we can grow and some of the crops are a bit opportune. Got a picture there of a canola crop, we've slashed out the male rows there and um, just a return on that, that went 1.7 tonne at $3,000 a tonne. So it shows a pretty good return. So all of a sudden you're putting a crop in the ground that was watered up in beds in bays. And it just gives you that assurity that you can, we're gonna put a crop in, we're gonna water it, we're gonna get a result. We have to buy water in the spring because we're not gonna, we know we are going to have to water it and, and we can get a return on it. We're not wasting water, we're not gonna waterlog it and end up with it. A bad result. Uh, and then further down the track, the last farm we bought was developed by a, 
investor. I think he was trying to sell it to a superannuation company and make it look good, so he put irrigators in and, and developed the whole farm. Uh, and then he went broke, and we ended up getting hold of it to probably a reasonable price. And um, so that's exposed us to the <coughs> overhead irrigators. And uh, it's a learning curve too, learning how to use them. But just the other thing too is uh, labour efficiency and to be able to do, there's 800 acres under the irrigator. And since we've taken onto the place, we've put another four spans on it, so now it covers a thousand acres. And to be able to water a thousand acres if effectively, um, got to fuel, fuel that up a few times a week. So your labour input compared to trying to do a border check or something like that is just, and <clears throat> we're still learning on that one. It's still a um, works in process, but we do consult. Uh, I think that's on the last slide. So we've still got rice in our rotation, and when we can, we'll, we'll put rice in. Uh, the whole operation's now geared up for the beds and the irrigator, and um, putting under them what we can, it's going to give us the best return. Uh, so that's that same canola crop we just watered up. Um, uh, what I mentioned before, maximising the water use efficiency. And um, the other thing we've done is Layouts that don't perform bad layouts, it's no point leaving them. Uh, we've just found with good dry land farming that we've got, that we've, the, the program we've developed now with direct drilling and retaining stubbles, we're much better off having them as just an open paddock and, and dry land farm them than we are trying to leave them in old contours and, and work them inefficiently. So it's all about efficiency, labour inputs, um, you know, jump on opportunities. We've been working with seed companies with our isolation, we're in an ideal spot that we can, they're, they're shouting out for seed growers for canola because they can't find someone that's got isolation from adjoining seed crops. So we've got a couple of those going in again this year and um, and we get a premium for them that with the systems we've got, we can still grow normal canola and still try and achieve high yield. So on the back of the beds and everything, we're still, we're pushing them along. <coughs> we've been putting, um, I was just talking to my son before the program, every, before we crop, we two and a half tonne of gypsum to the hectare and we're working with the feedlot. Um, we do silage for them. So we're putting about 10 tonne of, of manure on the, on the paddocks. We're just pushing them along and, putting, and, and building them up. And you can go out there with the shovel now and find worms in them. And I find that is a bit of a conflict, unfortunately. Troy won't want me to say this, but with rice, where you're ponding ground and the last, one, last thing you want to do is put gypsum on it. So the other system is we're opening the ground up, we're putting it on beds, we're stopping um, saturation, um, and we're just promoting um, deep drainage, deep roots. And um, so we've also, we're always looking at what crop we can grow. Uh, we've moved into cotton now, we've got a fair bit of cotton going in this year. We've only grown it for the first time this year, and we're pretty happy with it. And um, there's things we can fine tune, and we're always looking to improve. So, uh, you know, investing in soil and the agronomic performance, well, we're, we're always looking to work in with other people. A couple of others are doing cotton around our way. We work with them and our agronomist is quite good and we're gonna, we've got a discuss, discussion group growing with him that um, we'll have a group of farmers, progressive type farmers that want to move ahead and, and move on. And, um, yeah, so we're always looking to improve what we're doing. Um, we still have livestock, we've got a fair number of sheep on, so we've got dry land country, we do irrigate pasture, and over the years we've all learnt the, the benefits of um, lot feeding sheep and, and containment feeding, so we do a bit of that just to save pastures and maximise everything. And uh, yeah, the plan is that the farm will develop, Christopher's pretty keen to get rid of his headers and not travel around for six months of the year sitting in a header. He just wants to become a full-time farmer. That's our, that's our goal. And, oh, we've got two agronomists. One's a private one and, and one's a, from Nutrien. And uh, anyway, we find the one from Nutrien is very good. He's a progressive agronomist, so it's, it's who you're comfortable with. And, uh, but he's the one that's also got a group of people that are like-minded and doing similar crops. And he's the one that said, we'll put this discussion group together and we'll we we'll go from farm to farm and look at what everyone's doing right and what they're doing wrong. But the other one is 
just the, the normal network with friends. Um, we've got Lockie Bull, who's a bit of a uh, pioneer. Oh, you know, he's having a go. He's doing similar things. He grew cotton under his irrigator this year and worked on having a, a reduced water cotton crop just to see what he could get out of it because he had some uh, problem soils that didn't let the water infiltrate. And uh, I think he did eight, no, eight or nine bales on minimum water use, so he was very happy with that. So as a result of that, we've got 130 hectares of the irrigator earmarked that we didn't put wheat into, and that's going to be cotton this summer, plus country on beds. So with the price of cotton that it is now, it just nearly blows things everything out of the water. But, um, but on the back of the cotton, um, Christopher Strips for um, a, a big corporate up at Hay, and they go cotton, then they'll put durum wheat in after that. And so you've got the flexibility of double cropping. And, and so we had a, a uh, silage crop. The silage crop was chopped, and it's now a seed canola crop. So it's gone out of one into the next. And yeah, the other one oh, we had a go at this year was sunflowers. The advantage of sunflowers is they're a very short summer growing season with reduced water use. They're only about four megs per hectare. So it's just a good opportunity crop and they're worth good money now because with the, with the oil seed price and the crusher over at Wagga is developing a market for them and he seems very upbeat about their potential. But what, actually, just following on from your question before, just reminded me, when we went up to Hay to I escorted Christopher's headed up there and it's owned by a Dutch company. One of the directors was there at the time we were there and he had a nice bloke, had a chat to him. He did all the water trading. He lives in Amsterdam. And when I just had a brief conversation about the water job, he knew more about getting water out of the gold and the Murrumbidgee, the Murray. He, he just had a good grasp on it and he operated our water market from Amsterdam. <laughs>